hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 507 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Are you ready to twist, turn, and get our robotics groove on? Longtime friend of the show, Phil Hutchinson from Element 14, is joining me this week to chat about Element 14's new Twist, Turn, and Move Robotics Design Challenge. Also, a little later on, I investigate a new kind of robotic gripper inspired by jellyfish. So without further ado, please welcome Phil to Fish Fry. Hi, Phil. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. Okay, we're talking about Element 14's Twist, Turn, and Move Robotics Challenge today. Tell me about the contest itself, Phil. What was the motivation to create this contest? So I run quite a few design contests on the Element 14 community, and we see a lot of people very, very excited about robotics. It tends to be quite a scary subject for a lot of people. Whenever you see robotics in the real world, it's, you know, they're building cars, they're robotic butlers, they're androids, or they're uh, some of Toshiba's robots that are walking about and Boston Dynamics. And it's one of these things where no matter how big or small it is, T connectivity kind of has all the connectors for it, all the movable connectors, all of the attachments and all of the bits. And working with TE, we've come up with a challenge, which we simply call Twist, Turn, Move Design Challenge to really get people to think about all the things that do twist, turn, move. and could be counted as robots. So it could be the little carriage that picks up the soda from the drinks machine, the thing that is a multi-CD changer. You know, we used to have those in the back of cars. Any sort of movement project, whether that's all the way from something really complex on a production line to 3D printers are still movement devices. And we really wanted to kind of show off T-Connectivity's connectors, which as our main sponsor for it, and get the community and the Element 14 community to build something cool and really just kind of embrace movement in electronics. So... Bill, what were the requirements and how long did the participants have to complete their designs? So requirements, really simple. They had to use parts of the kit that could be one or multiple parts of T Connectivity's connectors, which were given out free to the applicants. And we also bundled in as the main microcontroller, the Arduino Uno, which is you know obviously very, very popular and very universally well known. And on top of that, some of the shields that go on top of the Arduino Uno, which have some built-in motor controllers. We really wanted to make the clever thing about this challenge what people did with it. As opposed to the build, it would be the idea that was kind of cool. Challenges applied online for free on the Element 14 community. We chose our favorites along with TE. And we gave them 11 build weeks to create something cool. And uh, we're just finishing up now, and we, we've got some really cool ones coming through. That's excellent. So tell me about the entrance. And anyone who completed five blogs and a project received a Multicomp Pro multimeter set, right? Absolutely. Multicomp is one of our brands over here at Element 14, Farnell, Newark. And everybody needs a multimeter. It doesn't matter who you are. It's one of those general tools, you know, like a Leatherman or whatever. Everyone needs a hammer, everyone needs a screwdriver. Once you have finished, whether you're a winner or not, as long as you follow the standard terms and conditions that we set with everything, we give you out a digital multimeter. They're just to everybody that completes it and does the five blogs and the barrier to actually getting something from one of our challenges on the Element 40 community is fairly low. You just come, enjoy, build something, get involved. Excellent. So what all kind of projects did you get sent? There's some that really surprised me. I really thought we were going to get a load of dry robotic stuff, but the community always surprises me. Doug, who is one of our top members, came completely out of left field, as he often does, and created Sammy Semaphore. And if you don't know what Semaphore is, anybody listening, it is 
communicating letters and positions and nautical information using flags. He created a robot that would teach and interpret semaphore. So he just has this tiny little robot with two flags and on its chest, it says which letter is happening. And he just took the brief and ran. And I just love that type of thinking. Dale, who is one of our regulars, came up with an unlimited CNC machine, which is a great tagline. So obviously CNC machines can court or they can probe or they can kind of have a a set range, right? This CNC machine is basically on wheels. So the idea is it can follow a path, it can go somewhere, it can start etching out a hole or leveling an area, and then move off to another space and continue the work there. So there's no build constraints as long as this robot can sit on top of it. We got a bunch of others, a bunch of fun ones, actually. We have RoboCat from JWR, who created a robot which follows around a laser pointer in the room. So instead of just a top-down line follower, It looks around the room, finds a laser pointer and goes towards it and can interact from there. We have a Rollit, which is an app-controlled robot, which uses rollers, which have been stolen from paint rollers, which is a fantastic way of creating wheels. We have a pool butler. Gary created a floating rubber ducky covered floating pool robot, which I believe may or may not bring you beverages of your desired uh, taste. Yeah, all sorts of things. We've got a bump-resistant rover, which has sensors on both ends, so you can see if it runs into stuff. And, you know, we've got a really cool robotic arm from Gustavo. Gustavo, really interestingly, so obviously at the beginning of this interview, I spoke about robotic arms, and they're kind of big and expensive, and they do heavy stuff. This robotic arm he created is all 3D printed other than the parts that we kind of provided and some bearings. It's on a thread screw so that it's got 360 degrees of rotation, but also the 3D printed parts follow the same idea as a 3D printer, and it will raise and lower. So it can work in 360 degrees of picking and placing, but also in height. A couple of others that have just finished off, and uh, we're going to be announcing the winners uh, very, very shortly for that. Excellent. So do you guys have any other cool contests coming up? We do. We have a couple. There's one that I can't really talk about, but I'm going to just say that it's coming up very shortly. We have one coming from Infineon in the very short amount of time. And obviously, everybody knows that Infineon have a fantastic platform, the PSOC 6, which is very popular. And we have some really cool stuff coming up with them. I'm very excited about And then for anybody that's turning up to Electronica, one of the big trade shows in Munich, we will be also launching a Save the Bees challenge at Electronica. So make sure you come see us and uh, check out that when it happens. I love that, Phil. All right. So we have talked a lot over the years about various design contests. So I'm curious, Phil, do you have an all-time favorite? I do. My personal favorite one, I believe I might have actually come and talked about this one on here, is One Meter of Pi. The concept of One Meter of Pi, it's a Raspberry Pi sponsored design challenge where you are being blasted off into space all the way to Mars. And obviously, as people know, there there isn't much space on a spacecraft, ironically. And you have one meter cubed of space to create a hydroponic garden of some kind to feed your crew. So you're hurtling through space with only this tiny cube of space to make sure everybody gets fed. We had some amazing entries and some very funny ones as well. We had somebody creating a mushroom growing system because all they needed was to create the humidity and maintain the balance. We had a robot which would pick and place all of the herbs and the vegetables in the area. We had A maintained garden where someone had to come and maintain it, but during the night it would be fed, the cycles of the light and day would happen. And then we had one particular person who entered while they were in the middle of their university uh, term time, and they built this enclosure under their bed. And I got a message saying, thank you very much. I've received, you know, whatever prizes we'd sent them. The university is not very happy with me because I left it running and uh, the underside of my mattress is all moldy now. Honestly, our engineers blow our minds with what they can come up with. The Element 14 community, great place to meet people and build some cool stuff. 
That is super cool. I love that, Phil. Now, I know that you are a bit of a maker yourself. So tell me something fantastic you've made recently. There's one particular project I am working on now. In the UK, we're moving you know, closer towards winter. And I, this summer, found liberated, took home, nurtured, uh, adopted a old K40 laser cutter. So the standard laser cutters that you'll see, and they're kind of imported en masse. And this one was behind a craft store, and it was it was looking all sad and alone. And it had been beaten up and used to create, you know, MDF Christmas baubles for the past 10 years. And I was like, ah, I will nurse it back to full health. What they don't tell you is it's water cool. There's water running through the glass tubes. And uh, if it starts to freeze, which we're heading towards, it can crack the laser tube. They're over $100 each to replace. So you have to build some way of keeping the water within the laser that's not being used warm. So ironically, you're heating the cooling system. That is a dad around, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's the backwards project I've been working on at the moment. <laughs> I love it, Phil. That's fantastic. Well, this was super cool as always. Thank you so much for joining me yet again, Phil. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me in support in the Element 14 community. And who won this challenge? It was an Element 14 community member that goes by the name Am Galbu, who designed a PV cell panel cleaning robot. The comments about this project were pretty great. The world is challenged to provide more green energy, and the efficiency of a cell is dependent on the pollution. People are challenged to keep their cells clean, and especially on roofs, it is almost impossible. The idea is great, and a simple solution that has the potential for more. Therefore, I would rate this project as a winner. And I agree. So if you want to check out the blogs written by this Element 14 community member about this PV cell panel cleaning robot, or to check out the other finishers of this contest, I've included a link in the YouTube description for this week's podcast and on the landing page on EE Journal as well. So what about those jellyfish-inspired robotic grippers? Get this, a team of researchers from Harvard's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences have developed a new kind of robotic gripper that actually uses a collection of tentacles or filaments to engage objects, just like how a jellyfish collects its prey. Individually, these tentacles aren't strong enough to grasp or hold objects, but altogether, they can securely hold odd-shaped objects and even heavy objects. And the best part, unlike other robotic grippers out there today that use machine learning, algorithms, um, feedback loops, embedded sensors, these grippers don't need any of that. They actually use inflation to wrap around the objects. Okay, so let's talk about these tentacles. They're actually about a foot long hollow rubber tubes. But importantly, one side of the tube is made of a thicker rubber, and this allows it to curl like a pigtail when the tube is pressurized. The entanglement of an object comes in when these tubes curl and wrap around each other and then the object and the strength of the hold increases with each entanglement. And when the object needs to be released, the filaments are simply depressurized. So what kind of objects are we talking about? Well, this team of researchers experimented with a wide range of objects, including toys, house plants, fruits and vegetables, and more. Their idea is that this gripper could be used in agricultural production and distribution, used to grip delicate tissue in medical settings, and even oddly shaped objects in warehouses like glassware. Professor Robert Wood, one of the authors of the corresponding research paper about this technology, says this about this new kind of robotic gripper. He says, this approach to robotic grasping 
complements existing solutions by replacing simple traditional grippers that require complex control strategies with extremely compliant and morphologically complex filaments that can operate with very simple control. This approach expands the range of what is possible to pick up with robotic grippers. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about this new kind of robotic gripper, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description as well. And these links also include a video of it in action. Do you want even more fish fry interviews about robotics? If so, I would strongly encourage you to check out my new playlist on YouTube called Robotics on Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. This series is chock full of all kinds of robotic goodness, including self-replicating living robots, Joyce, the first humanoid robot with intelligent vision, and tiny aquatic robots inspired by sea creatures. And you can check out this playlist by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com or you can just head on over to youtube.com slash eejournal and scroll down a bit and there it will be. Hey, have you checked out eejournal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I just mentioned, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and a selection of fish fry podcasts as well. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel too. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's fish frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of November 11th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.